This is a podcast from Rover. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the greatest NZ live political podcast in the world, The Working Group. Hosted by beloved left-wing broadcaster Comrade Bomber Bradbury. With the best political panel in New Zealand media. Reviewing the week. Setting the agenda. Avoiding defamation. The Working Group is brought to you by Gravity Credit Management. When the weight of capitalism is becoming the event horizon of an imploding black hole, call 0800 Gravity and our team will get blood out of a stone. That's 0800 Gravity. This is The Working Group. Kia ora, Ate ora. I'm your host, the editor of the daily blog, Martin Bomber Bradbury. Hashtag socialism, hashtag solidarity, hashtag Chippy's doing his best, I suppose. QAnon anti vaxxer incel free market lunatics to the right of me, insufferably humorless middle class woke cancellation lynch mobs to the left of me. And here I am, dear listener, stuck in the radical middle with you. This is the Working Group, New Zealand's best and greatest weekly political podcast. And isn't funded by New Zealand on air. Text WORKING to 3598 for all show updates and subscribe to our Rover, YouTube and Facebook pages. Joining me tonight to discuss the big issues is the greatest political panel in New Zealand broadcasting history. Our first panellists' musical tastes range from German composers to the sounds of weeping hungry children. He's Milton Friedman in really, really, really bad drag. He's never met in his Israeli ward to crime that he wasn't prepared to defend and justify the last male columnist at Stuff Without a Pronoun, the libertarian liquidator, the Cthulhu of capitalism, ladies and gentlemen, the honorary ambassador from Israel, Damien, all tax is theft. Grant Shalom, comrade, welcome back to the show. Kira. One word to describe the week, please, sir. Decay. Decay. We, um, you know, ferries are crashing Power poles are falling down in Northland. The roads are full of potholes. Uh, I think we we are a nation in decay, I think. Our next panellist is the rogue CEO who makes Richard Branson look boring. He's Elon Musk without all the douchebag shit. He's literally beat, he literally built New Zealand's internet from his garage. The founder of Voyager New Zealand and Burning Man aficionado, the force of entrepreneurial power that is CB Woodhouse. Kia ora, comrade, welcome to the show. Thank you, I like that intro. One word to describe the week, please, sir. Uh, interesting. Hmm. Interesting times. Yeah. And terrifying. Interesting and terrifying works. <laughs> and last, but certainly not least, for those of you who are watching our program at home on TV or on their phone, just press and switch on the Atlas Network filter <laughs> and you'll see tentacles growing out of her back. Former press secretary for Judith Collins, former broadcaster at the platform, current member of the Taxpayers Union stable of client agencies, political commentator and columnist at the gated community that is ZB+. It's Queen of the Turfs, Annie O'Brien. Kia ora, comrade. Welcome back to the show. That was quite an introduction and probably at least 50% correct. Uh, one word to describe the week, please, ma'am. Worrisome. Yep. I, I'm a little bit worried about a few things that our coalition government is straying away from, I guess, some of their promises. So I say worrisome. <laughs> Let's get into this evening's show. Issue one, we are all Aratea now. What does this fiasco mean for infrastructure in New Zealand? Issue two, military boot camps plus more police foot patrols equals what exactly? And issue three tonight, National fulfills half its cancer promise for twice the cost. Plus, we'll have a final word at the end of the show where each panellist can sound off to see who will breach broadcasting standards it's this week. Uh, the money's on Damien Grant. Let's kick things off tonight with issue one. After dumping Labour's plans for rail carrying ferries as a virtue signalling stunt to show National won't spend big, despite borrowing more in their budget than Labour did. The grounding of the Aratea, the Air Force plane breaking down and a power pylon toppling over, all symbolises the collapse of our underfunded infrastructure. Nicola Willis wants a Toyota Corolla version and has promised two ships that won't keep up with the population growth or emissions limits. The groundings of the Aratea symbolises New Zealand perfectly right now. Rudderless, 
underfunded and run by right-wing clowns. Damien, the political project of the right is to starve revenue to the state so that there is no money to redistribute in the first place. The political problem for you is convincing Kiwis that amputating state services for borrowed tax cuts is worth the pain. Will it be worth the pain? That's just that's just that's just a statement. It's not a it, it's it's not a question. We we do have a massive underinvestment in one trillion dollars. Uh, well, it's about one hundred and four billion, according to the Infrastructure Commission, and they are, to be fair, a government agency. So we probably have some degree of suspicion about them. Uh, by their estimation, we need to increase the number of people working in infrastructure from forty thousand to seventy eight thousand a day. I think we can confidently say that that is never going to happen. The state is not going to provide the infrastructure that we need, and we can see that with the ferry disaster. The private sector competition is still going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. We mile the state ship the ship of state has literally been grounded. The, 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 if you want to solve the infrastructure problem in New Zealand, you can't rely on the state. When the state did have the money, John Key blew $50 billion on it to maintain our living standards through the GFC because he didn't want to spend a single nanosecond or political support in doing anything that would actually restructure the, the, the society and the economy and improve productivity. And then the previous government borrowed $60 billion to do God only knows what. Thank goodness we saved grandma. For the amount of money Money. That was $60 billion. That would have been, what, two-thirds of our infrastructure deficit. And now that we're in this mess, we are not going to get out of it. The only hope is for somebody like C.B. Waterhouse to come in there. We need a private-public partnership. If we're going to build that second harbour crossing, it's going, to be, it's going to be somebody <laughs> like you, C.B., somebody like you. Follow-up question, if you queue. The decision to dump the Kiwi Rail ferry plan was always about rat-fucking Kiwi Rail for National's trucking industry mates did national rat fuck kiwi rail just a tad too much no <laughs> oh they need more rat fucking more <laughs> rat fucking of kiwi rail so the trucking industry continues its domination is that what i'm hearing how do you get a truck from picton to wellington you're gonna get some drones to move it I mean, the reason the trucking industry wants government money, they want your money, well, not your money, you don't have any money, you don't pay any taxes. They want CB's money, they want to tax him hard to pay for a loss-making ferry structure to get their trucks across the Cook Strait. That's what the trucking industry wants. The entire premise of your question, like your entire ideology, is upside down. Annie, the right solution to gridlock and underfunded infrastructure is more user pays and privatisation. Will voters agree? Mm, See, this is where I I disagree with some of my centre-right colleagues. Um, I I like a mix. I'm much more of a mix of private and public, so um, I'm going to sit on the fence with this one. Um, However, I think... You have come to the wrong podcast, (laughs) darling. (laughs) However, in the case of these ferries, as Damien pointed out, you've got two little blue bridge boats going back and forth, no problem, making a profit. Meanwhile, the absolute mess that Kiwi Rail have, have managed to achieve, um, you know, the the, the proposed uh, solution they did have w- went from 70, uh, $750 million budget to, to $3 billion. Um, to be honest, if they were a private business, shareholders or the board or whoever would have sacked the entire executive leadership. So, If you queue, follow a question. The engine parts for Cook Strait mega ferries were already built and tested when the contract was cancelled. At what point does Nicola Willis start looking compromised in her handling of this fiasco? There, I feel like um, there isn't a conspiracy theory you wouldn't indulge, to be honest. But um, I, I don't think that Nicola. Well, it's not has... a conspiracy theory. She did. That's exactly what she did. She <laughs> she's was the not one who did it. Kickbacks for it, though. No, no, she's just getting a kick. <laughs> it's not kickbacks. That's true. Look, um, they inherited a god ugly mess yeah. with with the situation, and. Um, the the situation of three billion dollars to be spent on a, on a couple of boats and I think a docking thing. It was the docking, a, it was the the docking, docking thing. thing is the was, expensive thing. Yeah. yeah, and um, you know, we spend three billion here. We don't have three billion to spend on our health system, our education system, the drugs that we're going to talk about later. There's not an infinite pot of money because we're the ones who put the money in the pot, and we ha- have to 
have a government that makes decisions based on biggest bang for buck. Now, in this case, as you say, investment was already made. It leaves her in a in a position of you know the fallacy of sunk costs. Do you keep going because you've spent yeah. a shit ton of money? Yeah. Do you spend a quadruple shit ton of money? Right. Burn uh, CB Bernard Hickey writes responding to the grounding over the weekend. The government has signalled it will buy new replacement ferries, but only enough to replace existing freight capacity. That would effectively limit Aotearoa New Zealand's ability to handle any growth in population or the need to reduce emissions by shifting r- freight from ra- road to rail over the next fifty years. How is National Solution anything more? than just kicking the can down the road at the expense of climate emissions in favour for their mates in the trucking industry. Well, I think I I liked Annie's point about Bluebridge operating fine. I I think the macro uh, issue is is that generally governments don't do a good job because they're spending other people's money. And so all progress is moved forward, uh, and Damien will like this, by the determined man uh, against the world who's incentivised by a profit motive. And so... If you look at someone like Elon Musk, you know, essentially NASA was basically doing nothing, having no ambition, not getting to Mars, not going back to the moon, spending a huge amount of the public's money, not inventing things like reusable rockets that could land themselves. And Elon Musk, you know, is a determined individual who put up his own money and achieved a nearly 100 to 100 to 1 better result. And so uh, I don't think, you know, spending government money unwisely is, is, is a great investment in, in Kiwi Rail. And I think Blue Bridge is doing a better, better job. And we're probably throwing money down the drain and getting a terrible result. Let's talk about that money going down the drain. Uh, Follow up question Maritime Union of New Zealand says, and I quote, cost of the new builds could be up to $1.2 billion, more than double the $551 million cost of the vessels for the cancelled IREX. Project one point two billion dollars seems pretty fucking expensive for a Toyota Corolla, doesn't it? Well, again, we come we come back to other people's money, and uh, I don't particularly trust government departments to, uh, you know, spend spend wisely. So, something that I was investigating for my for my blog recently was um, New Zealand's national debt was, as I understand, about forty fifty billion pre-COVID and it's now 180 billion. So our national debt has exploded by 120 odd billion dollars. But then if you actually look at the stimulus that, that was handed out, the, the the checks that we got for people staying at home was about 19 billion. So the people of New Zealand only received 19 billion in the hand in government subsidies, business subsidies, you know, stay at home. Uh, and, and five or six times more than that amount of money went somewhere. And I can't personally work out where it went. Did it go to politicians? Did it go to consultants? Did it go to Pfizer? Um, you know, it's it doesn't it doesn't seem like a good picture to me. And then we've got all of this inflation that we're going to have for probably the next decade, paying for what? So there's a hundred billion dollars. Where'd that go? That's what, you know. So. Damien, right now, we and when have- it and when it and went into house prices. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I made before. I mean, thanks to Adrian Orr, Adrian Orr, I made a million bucks, and I'm at the low end of the margin. Damien, so we have money. We have a far higher price point for the new builds that have just been ordered, a five year wait for those new vessels to come into service, and we haven't even discussed the cost to break the original contract, in, which could be two hundred million dollars. Uh, how dim apples looking for the political right? Again, you see, this is where you get so confused. The problem is the state, right? The private sector, what do they call Blue Bridge? <laughs> now, if it was up to them, they wouldn't be in this mess. Those guys worked it out and they said, okay, what, what are we going to do? The problem is you have a, um, a government agency, and I disagree. I think, um, I think the criticism of the board and, and, and Peter Reedy Perhaps a little bit unfair. They are dealing really? with. Yes, I do. I think that they they are dealing with an impossible situation. They they've got a, a workforce which is essentially a state-run workforce. They've got um, their their political economic masters keeps changing on a reasonably regular basis. And don't forget that Kiwi Rail, Kiwi Rail doesn't just have an economic focus. There is a political aspect to what they do. And so they're, they're, well, we need to treat. 
um, the Cook Strait Ferry is an extension of State Highway 1, I think, is a, is a political mandate that's come down. So really looking at that says, OK, well, given what the politicians want, maybe a $3 billion is, is is the solution. And OK, the previous government probably would have signed off on it. The current government it didn't. So I think Peter Reedy has been a bit of a, um, a, a everybody's kicking boy at the moment, and I think potentially unfairly. But... If this was a private sector operation, hmm. we wouldn't be in this mess. Somebody somewhere would have done the numbers, they would have spent the billion dollars and they make an economic return. And if they didn't, it wouldn't be up to me to bail them out. Annie, the right love to hold up Labour's $120 million bike lane that went nowhere as an example <laughs> of Labour's feckless accountability. Mm-hmm. But this fiasco in the space of a week has blown out cost-wise by $700 million. <laughs> has such reckless decision-making by National won the many friends here? No, I don't think. It, regardless of the accuracy of that comparison, I don't think it's won the many friends. Um, I think that they come out of this looking poor um, in more ways than one. Um, and I, I think that they will be kicking themselves for how they've handled it, not necessarily for, um, I guess, uh, they, they might think they've still done the right decisions, but the optic, optics of it are bad. Um, and, and of course, no one wants um, you know a, a slow and um, budget version of the Titanic happening in their back garden when they're trying to fund ferries. CB, are they going to privatise Kiwi Rail? Are they going to lop off the inter-islander and sell that? Breaking news in the last 35 minutes is that Luxon is considering that. I don't think it's a bad idea. I mean, we've just got a $700... $700 million problem and I mean at the end of the day all governments around the world uh, are broke not everyone kind of knows that it's not necessarily intuitive so governments don't have any money they only have the money that they take off one group and give to another so whether you're on the left side or the right side if, if you're on you know the um, you know the right then yeah take money off the beneficiaries and give it to me in tax breaks and if if you're on the left, then it's the other way around. You know, don't give tax breaks. I want I want benefits. But so all governments are doing really is really pushing money around from one group to another. Um, but you reach you reach. It's very easy for that government to then make that decision. Oh, we're going to spend seven hundred billion here, or we've got a loss here, or we're going to create inflation, or we're going to put the country in a hundred billion dollars of debt. And we don't get to say all that, and then we have have the problem. So I'm I'm a fan of small government, and I don't think the government should be involved in running a railway because they're never going to do a good job. Will <laughs> they? Do you think it's politically palatable though? We've got fourteen billion to borrow for tax cuts, but we don't have money for infrastructure. People aren't going to buy that. So when you say we don't have money for tax cuts, again, it's... Um, well, we just if, borrowed if, if, $14 if the, billion if the, if the tax government, cuts. If the government doesn't have that $14 billion in tax revenue, if the government takes that money off, the, off, off tax people, business people, uh, you know, that kind of thing, it's, it's, it's those business people that are actually going to create a productive economy. So the government's probably going to take that money and waste it, whereas private individuals are going to take that money and make it productive. So And privatise that wealth as well. Eh? Uh, quick round. Well, because our infrastructure is a joke, what should we rename the next boat? A, HMS Bottom Feeder. That's a very funny joke, Damien. B, HMS Landlord. That's even sharper, Damien. C, HMS Toyota Corolla. Well, it's a little bit more obvious, but I threw it in there anyway. What's the name? HMS Bottom Feeder. You love it. Come on. What, what's, what's wrong with Boaty McBoatface? I feel, <laughs> I feel that that was an opportunity that the British absolutely blew. And because, remember, they, they had the poll and Boaty McBoatface won in a landslide. And at the end of the day, they never went ahead with the name of that. So that is still out there. So what I think it. the next ferry needs to be Boaty McBoatface. Annie? Um, he's only saying that because he's clearly a you know a, a coloniser bringing the, the British names here. It's um, called Cook Straight. <laughs> Cook Straight. I will remind you, I just spent the last two days in Nelson. They have a Trafalgar Street. Oh, I was so... I, I loved it. CB? Of course it's got to be Toyota. You know, the Japanese, do a, to, the Japanese do a good job. It's not going to need any oil. We're going to be able to thrash it. Thrash it for a generation and not look after it, and it'll still, still keep running. That's the boat we want. The online poll has just voted right now, and it was Toyota Corolla, HMS Toyota <laughs> Corolla. That's what. That's what, 38%. They love it. Okay, comrades, right now we need a word from our sponsor. Uh, 
I wandered into the office of Gravity Credit Management to see Andrew Kingston uh, the other day, and he was sitting at his desk looking a little bit despondent. He had a cigarette in one hand and a glass of something in the other. And I said, mate, what, what, what's wrong? What's, what's the problem? And he was saying he was, just, he was concerned and he was distressed about the number of people out there with accounts receivables that are not getting paid. And he's saying, sitting there, I've got staff just waiting to get on the phones and collect that money. So if you want to help cheer Andrew up, if you want to do something for yourself and do something to improve Andrew Kingston's mood, then get in touch. Go to gravitycredit.co.nz or call Andrew Kingston on 0800 Gravity. If you've got debtors that are sitting out there at 80, 180 days, they're not going to pay. Let's face it. She's just not that into you. Call Andrew <laughs> and Andrew will chase her down. Got a bit Conrad's, sinister there. Yeah, kind of <laughs> sort of slid some of like, where the fuck's this going? Like, do we need an R18 rating? <laughs> Comrades, we must move on to issue two. Over the week, the Prime Minister, the Minister for Police and the Minister for Children fronted to boast their new war on crime virtue signals. We have created a new classification of criminal, the Youth Serious Offender classification, which does sound like a punk band from the 1990s. This new classification will allow the police to arrest 14-year-olds with Without a warrant for breaches of compliance, and we will then force those YSOs into military boot camps that don't work. Annie, uh, extra police foot patrols and military boot camps that don't work. This garbage isn't about solutions to crime. It's about the political theatre of playing up to right-wing feelings about crime and punishment, aren't they? No, I think um, it's not that they don't work. It's that you and others don't like how they work. Um, in, in both of these cases, there is plenty of evidence uh, that they can work um, for the... I'll start with the, the foot patrols. Um, Philadelphia did an experiment uh, in 2009. Didn't they make a movie about that? They may have done. I don't know. <laughs> oh, come on, that was such a good <laughs> joke. Anyway, continue. I, I don't know. If it, anyway, um, they... Uh, 2009, they did... Um, they split their um, city into 120 hotspots. Half of them, they did foot patrols, half they didn't, and there was a 23% reduction in crime in the foot patrol uh, areas. Since then, various other cities around the US have um, implemented it, and then miraculously the left comes in and takes them away, um, and crime goes back up. Um, Essex, by the way, has just started doing them um, as a measure to to deal with their uh, crime. So there's plenty of... um, kind of uh, evidence there. When it comes to these boot camps, I really don't want to disappoint people, but I'm going to. There is not going to be a van that pulls up on the side of the road and grabs these children, puts cloth bags over their heads and takes them to Guantanamo Bay. No, that's a Catholic church. Yeah. This is not going to happen. What's going to happen (laughs) is that, um, you know, these uh, specific children who've come from very probably deprived backgrounds, have had awful lives, are going to go into a situation where they've got structure, they've got a bed to sleep in, they've got food when they're supposed to have food, and they're going to learn some discipline, they're going to learn teamwork, um, and... Actually, um, it's probably going to be a hell of a lot better than the life that they live on a, on a regular basis. FUQ follow-up question. The 10 YSOs going into military boot camps now will each cost, you ready for it, Damien? You're going to love it, 500000 fucking dollars. The Oranga Tamariki staff who oversaw the fight clubs that were exposed inside OT youth prisons last year were given two weeks training. Just Wouldn't it be cheaper to properly fund staffing at these youth prisons rather than spend $5 million on a political virtue signal that isn't going to work? Thoughts? You've just said that you don't have faith in those same OT people to do these boot camps. That, and Ooh. So Ooh. either way, nice. it's the same It's the military people. who are running the boot camps. It's not OT. No. No, it's a collaboration with both. Yeah, yeah, they take them there. No, no, they, they are part of the entire process, but the um, it's still the same people. So I guess the answer to that is, do we defund OT and have it privately run? No, yes. that's probably a bad idea in my yes. view. Um, but I think that um, this, this kind of approach is something that people like to poo-poo before it's had a chance to to be tried Um, and I don't know that it will reduce crime but I think for the 10 kids that do go into this and if if there are more that eventually do as well 
they probably will will have um, a good chance at improving their own lives, whether or not that makes a marked difference to our overall picture. Um, I don't know, but it's probably 500000 well spent on them. CB, 21 police officers will be redeployed in Auckland City, bringing the total number of beat police in the central city to 51. But isn't the problem deeper? We have 208 police officers per 100,000 Kiwis. Compare that with 277 in England, 264 in Australia, 318 in Scotland, 349 in Germany, 422 in France. Hell, even Fiji at 227 has more police per 100,000 than we do. We never point out how underfunded our police force actually is. We need far more than 21 cops walking around Auckland, don't we? Yeah, I agree. I mean, National, National's promises was to get tough on crime and, and deliver deliver additional policing. And um, uh, what Annie was talking about, I think, before was, was related to broken windows theory, which is why Rudy Giuliani became so mm. popular. Hated. So broken broken windows theory is Why? kind of the, the thing that if you, um, you know, if there's warehouses with broken windows, they're tagged, you let people jump subway queues and things, all those small crimes kind of give people a feeling, oh, well, it's okay. How no many one's paying hundreds of millions to- dollars did that cost in court when all of those frisk and search charges, the illegal ones, came forward off his Well, I think New frisk York? and search. I think frisk and frisk and search is slightly different from broken windows. They're they're two different issues. You can do one, you don't have to do the other. But the point is, is that if you don't pay attention to small crime, then big crime naturally happens, and thieves get more emboldened. So you know, you get people ramming. Michael Hill and Takapuna in full view of everyone because they're like, well, no one ever did anything when I did the small crime, so I'm just going to do a bigger one. So, mm. yes, we need more police force and, and we need to get tough on those small things. Um, not not unjustly tough. I'm, I'm a little bit divided about the whole three strikes thing because, you know, um, some things that were illegal like selling weed or whatever, I don't, I don't think is, you know, I don't, I don't want someone going to jail for the rest of their life just because they smoke, you know, sold weed three times because I don't have a problem with that, you know. Uh, but violent crime, yeah, sure. Damien, I contacted Aranga Tamariki's media team yesterday to check, and there are no specific formal means for children to complain about being abused at the boot camps. <laughs> in the wake of the historic abuse in state care royal inquiry, shouldn't the boot camps have a specific complaint process to ensure they aren't, you know, <laughs> abusing wards of the state? We already have a private sector boot camp regime that's working incredibly well in this country. There are a number of fairly well-known suppliers. I mean, the mongrel mob is one. They run a very <laughs> effective regime of taking young kids at a very early age. I mean, the mongrel mob and killer bees. We've had some Australian operations coming mm. like circa. They, they come in and, they, and they, they provide their own system of getting young kids from deprived backgrounds and, and indoctrinating them into, a, into a, a regime. So I'm not entirely too sure why we are uh, concerned at this at this new development. The the only thing I don't like about the requirements to get in these boot camps is is, is really, really difficult. You've got to have two crimes with, with a potential penalty up to 10 years uh, notched up into about. I think we need to we need to lower the entry standards um, a, a little bit. Follow a question. This was Minister of Children uh, uh, Karen Chaw the great. on Q&A over the weekend. Karen, my job is to stop abuse and care. Jack, how do we stop abuse happening in boot camps? Karen, to be fair, that's not the point of boot camps. Kids not being abused in state care is her entire shtick. So shouldn't there be a tad more attention to that? Your entire objection to this regime... Is that it doesn't work and it's bullshit, that, meaningless, virtue signaling by the right? No, there is no evidence that... If it, you're going to put words in my mouth, get the words there right. Is, there is no... Ev- I mean, the, the, the commissioner, children's for commission... What? <laughs> the Children's Commissioner, I'm sorry, Dr. Claire Ahmed, are running around saying she was putting a post saying there's no evidence that it works. But then she doesn't actually go to link any – well, she's saying there's evidence that it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. They never provide it. The, the, the lack of research, of, of identifiable research on this is uh, quite stark. Dr. Jared Gilbert, however, did come out there and he said that – and he did say, to be fair – 
that the the evidence that boot camps work wasn't particularly strong. And in fact, he said in some cases the the evidence would seem to indicate that boot camps uh, are, are not particularly successful. Although we did say that if there was a focus on rehabilitation and not punishment, that mm. there was um, there was something there. But let's not forget the kids that are going to be selected to go into this regime are already lost. If you get to that point, by the age of 14, you've got two convictions with up to 10 years sentence, you are gone. You are finished. You are over. Your life is, is, there is nothing for you in the current regime. You are a lost child. And whilst I don't necessarily have a lot of confidence that the boot camps will work, because like Kiwi Rail, it's run by the state and it will <laughs> almost certainly fail. At least it is, it is they are attempting to do something as opposed to the current situation. And the current situation is not working. Quick round to all of you. Between 1981 and 2002, we had boot camps for young offenders and it had a <laughs> 94% reoffense rate. John Key brought them back and it had, wait for it, 83% reoffense rate. What will this latest attempt create, Damien Grant? The reality is. And I can attest to this more than anybody else. A political, a, a a criminal justice system that does not teach consequences only leads to individuals committing larger and greater crimes down the track. Now, okay, the current system may or may not be be working. Boot camps may or may not be working. But instead of all of this hand wringing by the lights of the children commissioner come up with something have 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 your own idea just sitting there and whinging to say that the current regime isn't working is not a solution so you, you don't have a number you just hey fuck it let's go well, cuz cuz i see cuz there is there uh, is no there is there is well, no then there, there way is to research measure this. well what that, that but okay, okay give Maybe me the research give 90, me the research 1981 to 2002 94% reoffence rate John Key brought them back. It had an 83% reoffence rate. Define reoffence. Yeah, they, I mean, they, they, I mean, they, were the they were committing a criminal act the, the, within the, two the, years. The, That's the reoffence um, start. The, the, de, the devil is always in the detail mm. in okay. these Annie, things. And I'm sure well, if what, I go what, and look at them, bullshit it numbers, be What say. bullshit numbers do we need to give Damien to back him up? Look, I agree with him on the um, front of... Look, it's not working what we're doing now. And there are a lot of people who are very upset about how this is not going to work. However, no one's talking about the fact that we have a current revolving door which sends these kids from committing a violent crime into youth court, have an apology and a mediation, back on the street go hold up another dairy. And it's that cycle that goes round and round. So there's got to be an intervention. This may not be it. I don't know. But let's give the pilot a go. We've definitely come a long way in the way that we think as a society about these things. We're not going to approach it as a punishment thrashing camp. It's going to be more of a rehabilitative one, like you say. But let's give it a go. It's an intervention. Um, it's a hell of a lot more than the last government was doing. So we don't. So no figure? No, no okay. it's a stupid CB? question. Can I, can I raise it to a more helicopter view? Um, clearly there are concerns about you know World War three we seem to be entering an era where there's more conflict and you know Russians and Ukrainians are very similar people but they're at each other's throat we've got climate change causing a whole lot more problems and stability I'm personally worried that you know we've got what one one dinghy and a paper plane that doesn't work for for an air force and an a force we have no defenses and I I, I really think we should be building up uh, you know our, our army capability I mean we love our Australian brothers and sisters but if Australia becomes essentially unlivable because of climate change what's to say they're not going to say oh well you know sorry guys but we're going to come and move down to you you're so, so right you're so right I, about that as the Australians of the fleet I think, can I we think meet the, this guy I think the answer <laughs> I think the answer is, I think the answer uh, about the boot camps is not to treat them in isolation um, but to essentially provide you know these kids with structure and and a, and a, and a the promise of a career and an actual career that they can go to in the army because they're either going to become gang members or they could become army members. So if we so, have so you know, we're good we have with it solid, now. Solid, solid, <laughs> solid career options and say, hey, look, this is not just some punishment where you'll you'll suffer for you know sixteen months and then you'll get out and you'll go back to the killer bees and that thing. This is actually a, a life path and you can have a career and you can fly helicopters and you can do this and there's those cool kind of things and you know we're often dealing with like. Yes, we have to worry about these kids getting abused and things in, in our care. 
but they're often really, really tough, violent kids. And so if you want people to defend your country, you want the people that are testosterone and tough. And so we need to be saying to these guys, hey, you're the heroes, you know, like turn around this life of crime, you know, join join the army. This is the pre-training. The, the ones that are heroes will get selected. Get they need CV to sell the shit. That's you know? what they need. Hold they on. need CV to sell CV, the shit. CV, CV's theory is we need to build up the army to go to war with Australia. I mean, <laughs> come on, I, I love it. I, I love just, it. I lo- I he's, just, not, he's, I just, he's making so much sense. Okay. My head is wanting so think, much. Can I, can I mean, I can, have, when, when, are you, when are you running for New Zealand can first? I, can, no. I have another, can I have a ton of other two minutes? <laughs> so, <laughs> said the actress to the bishop. I don't, I don't, think, I don't, think, I don't think we want... Look, if if you if you if you uh, if you if you aren't able to uh, threaten any violence at all, you're not you're not honourable. You're just helpless, you know. And so I think we need some kind of uh, you know showing that hey, we're like a tough people. We're a warrior warrior people. You know, Maori people come from that kind of warrior thing. Anything to scare and the Australians away. I'm with them. I am with well, this man. I love him. We can beat them at rugby, but there's four times That's five right, times exactly. as many. Four or five times as many. But look, the thing is, is that I don't think we want to get to a situation where, you know, like in the US, everyone has a gun and all that kind of thing. But I, I personally think that we should have four million guns locked up in depots and around, you know, cities, cities <laughs> around New Zealand. from Australia. Yes! Auckland, whatever. And I think, I think we should have a significant amount of the population trained in how to use a weapon. In case the Australians basic come. training. And, and I think that... I think you that lost these, me now. <laughs> I think that these use things could be part of that. It's like you learn how to use a gun. It's cool. CB, have you They're gonna have protect you us met, from Australians? Have you met any New Zealanders? Because I'm not too sure that the vast majority I wouldn't trust anybody in this room with a gun. Certainly, certainly not Damien. Not not I'm not saying I'm not saying I'm not saying And you want to give, give four million guns. Okay, no, okay, we're no losing. that's not what I said. What I'm saying is I You've think lost everyone, the narrative now. <laughs> I don't think everyone should be given a gun. I think I think four You're million people. Who are you going to give it to? Some away. of these people are going to vote for Who the Greens. I think there should be a depot, and they think there should be a depot in uh, in in North Head okay. with a whole bunch of guns. And if if anything use bad North happens, Head, that would be a good use go of North Head. Uh, Seventy-seven. The poll online right now uh, with the voters uh, with the, the with the viewers. Seventy-seven uh, percent believe <laughs> that uh, boot camps won't work. Comrades, we <laughs> must move on to issue three. So after. After being blasted by every commentator in the country for finding 14 billion in borrowed tax cuts and 2.9 billion for landlord tax loopholes, but not the 280 million for the 13 promised cancer drugs, lo and behold, National managed to find the cash to fund them. They managed to fulfil half their promise at twice the cost. CB, has this been an embarrassing back down for the government? Uh... I don't know about embarrassing, but I think it's just one more example of the government having uh, terrible purchasing power and, and the New Zealand public getting ripped off. Again, um, me and Damien, I'm sure, agree, small government is best. You do this stuff privately and you have a better outcome. So, you know, there, there are some things that the government needs to fund, but in general, when it's other people's money, it's just like, oh, we've got to make a decision, let's just sign a $2 billion check, sorry, you know, and then we all have to pay for it. So. Damien, good news is this cowardly government can be shamed into doing the right thing. Bad news, it cost us twice as much. Why did National name the 13 cancer drugs in the first place and allow those pharmaceutical companies to push the prices up? Well, political incompetence. I mean, mm. if it's up to me, Grandma, I'm sorry, Grandma, you've got to, you've got to take one for the team. He's just so, he's so rough. Annie, um, for all those facing cancer and their whanau, this is a great victory for public health and activism. What has the national government learned? Um, I hope that they have uh, learned that it was bloody dumb. Like, I do not know who thought it was a good idea to go, we've promised these people who are seriously sick, like the worst kind of sick that you can be, um, that we're going to fund these medicines, they don't have to move to Australia, um, and then once they voted for us, we're going to say, oh, you might just have to wait a little bit longer. Um, we're not sure about this anymore. So that was one mistake they made. The other mistake was the promise they made was not able to be fulfilled anyway because 
the government doesn't directly negotiate with um, drug companies. It's up to Pharmac to make those purchasing legally, decisions. Legally, It's supposed to be yeah. de- independent yeah. as well. So really they had no business to make that call. They could have perhaps approached it more broadly and said, this is kind of ring fenced for cancer treatment, um, but they didn't. So the whole thing, while as you say, fantastic news for those who now can access the drugs. Over a hundred thousand. That's an immediate change for many people's yeah, lives. Yeah, it's huge. And for for those people who unfortunately are going to get diagnosed sometime in the future as well, it's a totally, massive thing. Totally, yeah. But a complete and utter political clusterfuck. Like I just don't know where the thinking was on it. Comrades, we must wrap the show with a final word. Damien Grant, your final word this week, please, sir. I want to talk about Julian Assange. Um, He is, like a lot of individuals in the public eye, his is a complicated story. I think Julian Assange is an enormously courageous individual who exposed some massive misdeeds. Mm. He has made the point that most of the wars in the last 50 years were started by government lies. I think it goes a lot back further than that. I think the governments are... Uh, they do a number of things really well. War, one made man-made famine and genocide being the, the three outstanding achievements of the state and Julian Assange managed to demonstrate that. Uh, I do think, though, we need to put some caveats around it. Julian Assange was utterly reckless in the way that he um, he was prevailed upon by secret service agencies when they knew what he had to redact some information about some individuals who was working for the West in a struggle between the West, um, between the forces of democracy and the forces of tyranny. Uh, if you cannot decide whether one side is right or wrong, then you have a severe moral blind spot and Julian Assange had that and there were some good people who lost their lives as a result of, of his reckless narcissism in my view a deeply complicated individual and a completely in a very complex story um but i think the 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 correct result was achieved annie your final word this week please look i think i've been quite kind to the government in many ways um this evening i'm going to put the boot boot in now um i think that uh, nicole mckee we may have to start calling her the dentist because she has taken the teeth out of three strikes and um she was helped by paul goldsmith perhaps he is the dental nurse um but if we look at the law, it is nothing like the previous three strikes law. It is so weak that, Bomber, you probably will like it. Um, and the, judici- the judiciary will love it because it gives them more um, ability to exercise what I think is bad discretion. Um, basically, about 30% of the offender types um, which had previously been covered um, under the law will be covered under this one. And about 13,000 violent offenders are going to have um, a clean slate, effectively, where they get rid of all of the strikes that they would have had in the last four years. So there is a lot to not like about it. Um, and because of this, um, I have... Um, join some people who are reinvigorating, reactivating the Sensible Sentencing Trust. And um, we are going to oppose this law um, and try and put some pressure on to get some teeth put back into it, um, to get the um, kind of parameters around manifestly unjust looked at. Um, So, yeah, I am not happy with it and um, lots of other people aren't. (laughs) The terrifying rebirth of the Sensible Sentence and Trust. Who would, have th- who would have thought it would have happened on the working group? CB, your final word this week, please, sir. Look, I'm here as a business person, and, and the rest of you are sort of consummate uh, politicians. You've held your own. Yeah, I've held my own, sure. Um, <laughs> and but the camera, the, the did, the camera the... didn't catch you holding your own, so it's... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Shut up. I mean, the, the word on the street, uh, I own a dozen businesses, employ 150 people, and obviously everyone is kind of, you know, struggling with inflation and that kind of thing. And something that I've heard a little bit, I think there's, from my perspective, a misunderstanding. You know, there are people that say, oh, you know, businesses are greedy and they're putting up their prices and that kind of thing. But actually, from my perspective, businesses often shield the public from inflation because businesses don't want to lose customers and so when uh, inflation starts hitting us and our, our supply costs go up oftentimes what will happen is the the margins that we were making as businesses disappear because we don't want to you know and it takes time for a business to increase your price and and you're afraid that if you increase your price first then your you know customers are going to go to your competitors and that sort of thing so 
um, current the current definition of inflation is as prices go up and you know governments like to blame you know the the, the greedy uh, employers and, and you know, oh you put prices up and that kind of thing but if you look in a dictionary from a hundred years ago inflation was literally defined as expansion of the money supply and so from my perspective all inflation comes from central bank and government policies and over COVID, yeah, sure, it was nice that we got you know paid to sit at home. But as I say, the public only received 19 billion of stimulus, and yet 120 billion dollars of debt was created. And I don't believe that debt came from it, right? The rise in house prices—that's a different matter. So, um, you know, I think I think my uh, desire is that we have a return to sound money, and instead of central banks basically saying, "Hey, get drunk on cheap credit," and then, "Oh, we're going to suck it all out again," and you know, bankrupt everyone, and, and we go th- we go through this thing, you know, constantly. Um, I, I'm supportive of crypto, but there's, there's, there's pros, there's pros and cons. <laughs> I actually should have been a crypto billionaire yeah, because yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, so actually, I. I actually yeah. read I actually read the Satoshi white paper in 19, oh, sorry, 2008 when it came out. I thought this is brilliant. Got into it hacked around and, and in those days you could create you know two bitcoins a day on a fast computer so I got into it and spent seven years trying to tell people oh this is this is cool and fiddling around as a hobby and then by 2015 I thought oh, this is ridiculous it's 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 a bubble it's a hundred dollars I'm just going to get out sold my bitcoins oh, no. and then basically yeah I mean I, yeah I should have been very wow. very 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 rich we're but, all weeping um, we're all yeah, weeping yeah so <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, I'm here. You know, I'm here <laughs> with you coming. I could have been a crypto billionaire, but fuck it, I'm on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Love you, CB. Thank you, Grant. Uh, if you like what CB has had to say, and you, you are will. absolutely not going to take any financial advice from him, at least because you know there are clearly some um, had some successes and or oh, some near misses. You can find CB at cbseby.blogspot.com, and uh, you can. No, sorry, it's don't cor- C- do not correct me. <laughs> it's it's when he's wrong. Especially when, when he's wrong. wrong. Don't give me yeah, it's my, bl- it. my blog is cbsruminations.com. There we go. CB's CB's ruminations. Dot bit of a hard com. word, sorry. Okay, cbsruminations.com. You're going to need to learn how to spell ruminations. Um, that's where you can find. Uh, is that a free uh, rumi- is ruminations free? Yep. You can subscribe for free, yeah. You can subscribe for or free. You can, or you can pay me to do some research, but that's just voluntary. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's voluntary. Um, get, um, uh, and CB's uh, excellent organisation, Voyager, sponsors the, the Media Awards. Despite, despite the fact I've never even been nominated, we still got to in the podcast. Um, if you like what Annie O'Brien's had to say, you can catch Annie O'Brien at A-N-I-O-B-R-I-E-N. Martin won't be able to do that because I understand he's blocked you. But <laughs> I'm, so, I'm going to ask him when we finish. No, 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 no. The best, everyone. the best thing you can do is be blocked by the just the, the random hate stuff that comes out of Martin's uh, Twitter feed. But if you like what Annie's got to say, and also uh, you hit it here first, Annie is reigniting the sensible sentencing trust. Obviously, my application to lead the organisation was failed. <laughs> <laughs> Which I suppose it would have been funny, although I disagree with so much of the organisation has got to do. Um, Martin, if you want to take it away. Thank you, comrades, to my final word this week. Two things. The first is to mark the passing of comrade Keith Locke, a dear friend of mine for the last 25 years. His funeral today was a wonderful celebration of his intellect and his life, and our thoughts are with his whanau and his dear Michelle. I walked out of Keith's beautiful funeral to learn Assange had been freed, a moment of justice in a dark world. Keith would have been proud. If he is in heaven right now, I know he will be unionising the angels. Rest (laughs) in peace, dear comrade. The second thing this week was the spastic foaming rage from the right-wing troll hate bots because Jacinda Ardern appeared in their news feeds. Apparently, her getting a movie made about her is the end of Western civilization as we know it. Milk will curdle, planes will fall from the sky, and cats and dogs will start living together. Comrades, if you are more concerned with a movie about Jacinda than the racist hard right climate denying beneficiary bashing government implementing culture war revenge fantasies of social policy while borrowing billions for their donor mates to implement an anti maori anti worker anti treaty anti environment anti renter agenda if it's just cinder that is making you angry might i suggest maybe you're the fucking problem 
<laughs> now he's talking with the weather. And you wonder why we can't get a sponsor. That was the Working Group, New Zealand's number one weekly political <laughs> podcast that is not funded by New Zealand On Air. Remember, text WORKING to 3598 for all show updates and follow us, comment and like us on Rover, YouTube, Twitter, TikTok and Facebook. We'll see you Tuesday next week. Kia ora and kapai. You stay classy, Aotearoa. Hooray! That was New Zealand's greatest weekly political podcast, The Working Group. Not one minute of this show was funded by New Zealand On Air. No, no creamy public broadcasting money for us. That was The Working Group.